has changed starting with tonight. So tonight we're going to be having a dialogue on an important city issue like affordable housing. And next month we're going to have a talk back session. And that is we'd like you to come back and join in in a solutions focused discussion. So that's going to be something that can move these issues forward, I think, in a meaningful way. Uh, we look at a lot of trends in our Toronto's Vital Science Report. And the Toronto Community Foundation is particularly concerned about the fact that Toronto has slipped from being a seriously unaffordable place to being a se severely unaffordable place. And this gives cause for concern on a number of different fronts. Uh, we look at uh, the fact that it slipped to uh, 75th least affordable out of 325 housing markets surveyed. We also look at the fact that uh, median house prices are over five, per, uh, five times median uh, family incomes. And we also look at the fact that the waiting list for um, affordable housing has grown by over 10% up to 66,460 which is actually a 38% increase since 2008. So these are things that we need to be talking about. What does all this mean for our families? What does all this mean for young people in the next generation? That's exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight. So thank you all for coming. It's my great pleasure to introduce Peter McLeod, who will be the moderator for this evening. Peter's got a wonderful bio, but the thing that really leapt out at me is that uh, as a fellow of the Center for the Study of Democracy at Queen's University, wrote and spoke a lot about the importance of public imagination. And so hopefully that will give us some new thinking. Um, Peter is the co-founder and principal of Mass LBP, which is a consulting firm that works with corporations and government to deepen the public engagement and dialogue uh, around important issues. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Peter. Thank you very much, Roslyn. Uh, it's really nice to be back here at the ING Direct Cafe and uh, to have the time and space uh, as we do this evening for this discussion. Uh, affordable housing or the affordability of housing in Toronto is something that is, you know, on everyone's mind. If you are trying to purchase a property in Toronto right now, it's a tough thing to do. If you're reading the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, or Metro, or any of the uh, Young Street media, uh, then you are probably uh, weekly, if not daily, seeing articles that have something to do with an overheated property market and how it is that families can afford to make their lives in the city of Toronto and so on and so forth. Uh, with me this evening are, are three people who are going to help uh, talk about this issue from different angles. We're going to go until about 8 o'clock. They each have about 10 minutes or so to make their case to you. But before I introduce them, and you're thinking to yourself, three people, and you only see two, we've got uh, David Cowan, who is on the line uh, from the UK, and he's the CEO of People for Places. But I'm going to say more about that in a moment as well. So, so long as my black slides are working, you know, I was asked to moderate this session, I thought affordable housing, right? It's something we all seem to be concerned with, but how much do we really understand about it? So if I'm clicking this thing, ah, and I'm gonna click it again, there we go. This is a, a fabulous, if not slightly dispiriting advertisement that appeared in Toronto newspaper in 1947. And it talks about there being an acute housing shortage in Toronto. In fact, it goes on to say, do not come to Toronto for housing accommodation. The city will not take responsibility for you or your family. It's signed by both the mayor and the city clerk. No, 1947. <laughs> uh, what that says is, you know, affordability in housing is something that Toronto, as a growing city, has been struggling with for a very long time. I think everyone would understand that in 1947, following the Second World War, Toronto had been building a lot of housing stock for quite a while, and there were thousands of people trying still to leave Europe to start a new life in North America. Well, many of you will be familiar with the Vital Signs Report. It's really the basis for tonight's discussion. It's put out every year by the Toronto Community Foundation. It's an excellent barometer of what's happening in terms of a whole series of social trends in the city. 
they have a section, not surprisingly, devoted to housing. And it paints, uh, I think, again, dispiriting picture of where we're at. Let's first try and clear up some of the lingo attached with affordable housing, because it can seem like an elastic term that means it's almost everything. So they, I just wanted to, uh, to break it out into three. These are not, uh, you know, uh, what's the right term here? The canonical. They are not canonical terms, but for the purpose of, of our discussion tonight, I think they'll be useful. Affordable housing itself is the largest category. When we talk about the affordability of housing, we're referring to the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation's definition, which means that if a household is spending more than 30% of its income on housing, then you've probably got a problem, that housing is then unaffordable. And the truth is that for 60 or 70% of households in Toronto right now, they're spending uh, more than that 30%, right? Subsidized housing is a term that we're going to use, and it's a bit awkward, but for the units provided by Toronto Community Housing, by nonprofits, co-ops, uh, rent subsidies, and seniors' residences. And we're going to talk a bit this evening about the wait list, something else that gets a lot of attention, and how it's been growing over the course of the past many years. The last bit then is uh, assisted housing. And that's housing where services are actually provided to the residents. And there's separate wait lists for people looking for long-term care units. They need help because of disabilities or addiction. So it's just a distinction I want to make about the kind of global category of affordable housing uh, as distinct from subsidized housing. So here's a, a slide, a graph, that shows you two cities. And it's very, it's very small for you to see. The point is just the trend lines. Uh, red is two-story, blue is bungalow, and gray is condo. And what it points to is the percent of household income taken up by ownership costs. So you see that all of these lines, with the exception of condo in gray, are well over 30%. In fact, it's more like 58, 57% here for two-story bungalow around uh, 50 and in Vancouver, which is always cited as the most expensive place to live in Canada, certainly one of the most expensive places to live in North America and increasingly in the world, well, we're well up to 70s and 80s in terms of the amount of your household income that you're spending on housing. What's interesting about this graph is that it's a flatter line than some of the headlines would suggest. So you have to think about why that line might be flat or at least gradually increasing. It's masking a lot of things that are going on, many of which have to do with interest rates, right? Because interest rates drive the affordability of housing to no small measure. It also doesn't tell you anything about the household incomes in Toronto themselves, and whether you simply have people with greater means living in the city as those with lower incomes are pushed to the periphery. These are all trends that make for a really complicated housing story and part of why it's worth discussing tonight. So let me just give you a couple of fun facts, part of the big picture. Keep this on top of your mind. There are about two and a half million people living in the city of Toronto. There are one million households. So that's a good number to keep in mind because a million, and remember that so when we talk about proportions, you'll know how many uh, households proportionately are affected. In June of last year, the average price of a house in Toronto was up 6% over the previous year, $453,000 is what it would cost you to buy an average house in the city of Toronto. It's about $350,000 in the greater GTA. So there is a real drop off outside of Toronto's borders. 50% of people in Toronto rent about 30% provincial. Again, not a surprising phenomenon in as big a city as ours. So what does it cost to rent? Well, the average rent within the city of Toronto for a two-bedroom apartment has now reached almost $1,400 as of 2010. So it's already gone up a bit in the two years since. That's an important number to hang on to as well. Finally, Toronto's affordable housing wait list, which is properly a 
subsidized housing wait list. People looking to get into nonprofits, access rent subsidies, uh, avail themselves of Toronto community housing properties, an all time <coughs> high, not of 83,000 people, 83,000 households are waiting to get in, which is about 160, maybe 200,000 people are waiting to get into some form of subsidized housing in the city. And that number has gone up every year since the early 90s, dramatically. So when we talk about an affordability crisis, we see a number of, of trends that are driving this phenomena, and that's why we've got such good people uh, to talk with us this evening. Uh, Last bit, sorry, I forgot to mention, this is the wait list. We went up from 67,000 in 2006 to 76,000. The most recent number is 83,000 households. That's a lot. It's especially a lot when the number of people you're actually housing each year is declining from 5,000 a year in 2006 down to only 3,700 in 2010. There just aren't the spaces. People aren't transitioning out of subsidized housing into market house. All right, so there's the backgrounder. I can now sit down and actually hand it over to the experts, something I'm very grateful to do. Um, we're going to be hearing first from Neil, uh, actually we're going to be, we're going to do this in reverse order. Great. That makes sense. So Neil Hetherington, who's immediately to my left here, is the CEO of Habitat for Humanity Toronto. A um, couple of fun facts, uh, in 2000, when he became CEO 12 years ago, he was then the youngest CEO of all time in the Habitat for Herma uh, Habitat for uh, It's easy for you to say. Thank you. <laughs> Habitat for, for Humanity, humanity <laughs> Housing uh, uh, Universe, right? Um, but more impressive is the fact that when he took over, they were building about a quarter of a house a year. So, gives you a sense of how long it takes to get anything done. They're now building more than 80 houses all across the city. So it's an impressive track record. He's also one of these guys who's a trustee of the Toronto Grace Hospital, a member of the advisory board of the Salvation Army. Uh, he's also active, a volunteer with Out of the Cold, the Ontario Prayer Breakfast, and a deacon at the York Minster Park, the sort of fellow who makes the rest of us feel a bit like a slouch. Uh, sitting next to him, uh, no slouch himself, is Norris Lalani. He's the vice president of Mod Developments. Uh, he is one of the guys responsible for seeing these big towers keep climbing out of the ground in Toronto. Uh, most recently, the five condos at St. Joseph Street, just off of Young. And hopefully in July, if everything goes according to plan, you'll see the Massey Tower spring up out of the site of the old 1905 CIBC building here on Young Street. Finally, joining us from the UK, I say this with fingers crossed, is David Cowens, the Group Chief Executive of an extraordinary organization called Places for People. Now, Places for People, that sounds all soft and cuddly, right? In fact, it manages a property portfolio worth three billion pounds and about 62,000 homes in the UK. Interestingly, it began as a housing association which he has transformed into places for people, a diverse business that offers a range of products and services to build and manage communities that can prosper and be sustainable in the long term. One of our goals in this series is to try and get some inspiration, not only from you know the best of us here at home, but from abroad as well. So we're going to tune in to David and invite him to tell us just how it is that Places for People came about. because we see all the towers, we see all the cranes, uh, we hear about the kind of astronomical prices for penthouses and all the other sensationalism around the real estate market in Toronto, but few of us really understand what's going on, what's driving it, what the real costs are, how it is that affordable housing can or cannot be integrated in the sorts of things that companies like yours are trying to do as they reshape the face of the city. Well, first, thanks very much for having me here. 
Um, and I'll apologize in advance for dripping the way I am. Um, but anyways, to, to answer your question from a number of angles, firstly, um, developers like mod development, um, and, and frankly many of my colleagues in the industry, uh, try to focus on social housing and, and affordable housing and sustainable housing. Because we all feel that uh, you know, when we have these industry gatherings, that um, the evidence is there that shows that society and communities are a lot better when we have a mix of people. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, pricing is the main factor why uh, that doesn't always occur. And um, so when, when we look at, in the private sector, developing sites, and as you, as you say, there's these many towers, I think it's 189 cranes we have in the sky, or, uh, and, uh, and Neil was just was telling you before we started, uh, far more than New York and anywhere else in North America, the world right now. Um, it's a function of the market, it's a function of the strong immigration that we have to Toronto. Um, I think it, it is it's starting to be shaped by transportation times and our clogged transportation routes. As you can see, sites that are on the Young Corridor and other corridors or transportation lines are commanding the premiums uh, that they are. So I think um, it's a function of the market. Uh, we as developers are having an increasingly tough time not only acquiring sites, because landowners are very savvy in Toronto and they know what their sites are worth, or they, they think they know what they're worth, and uh, we have the battle of trying to bring them down so we can offer a more affordable product. Um, and at the same time, um, the, in, the increasing infill nature of the sites that we're building and assembling tighter sites drive our costs up. So, um, you know, to take a strictly mathematical point of view, a certain margin has to be achieved for us to take the risk that we do. Uh, a prime example is mod development site next door, uh, the Massey Tower. Um, I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to walk by it and, um, and walk the site. It's an extremely tight site. Uh, besides our goal to convey some of the land to Massey Hall in order for them to uh, renovate and expand their facility, to build on a postage stamp site like this site here, 197 Young, has driven our, our costs up and therefore you know, our revenues that we need to achieve have gone up in, in response to those increased costs. So I think um, you know, when, when you first approached me to come speak, I said, if you look at it, it's very simple to a certain degree, it's almost like baking a cake or building a widget. You know, there's just ingredients that go into the mix for us to build our units, and then we hopefully flog them to the community and they buy them, and we make a, a decent margin, and uh, you know, that's how, we, that's how we grow our company just like any other private sector business. So, um, but one of the so-called ingredients in our, in our cake baking process is the charges that we uh, incur and pay in the form of various taxes, building permits, education charges that become part of our cost to build. And um, you know, as part of our uh, days on end of number crunching, one of the things that we look at is what is the average cost per unit in all of these public charges that we, the developer, um, are responsible for paying. And it works out to be about twenty-five thousand dollars per unit. Now, if you look at the Massey project here next door, we are hopefully going to sell 700 units there, and at uh, 25,000, looks like I'm going to be perfectly cut off here. Um, at 25,000 dollars a unit, you can see that that's quite a, a quite a uh, contribution to the public coffers. So, um, you know, in terms of finding and making our communities better, so that we can have different income mixes, you know, families and small children. Um, you know, I think that. It's quite a large amount of money is going to the municipal coffers that I also feel not only does the municipality have uh, responsibilities to try to rent subsidize, but I think the feds need to start getting involved as well um, and, and, and helping municipalities help us in, in the end have better communities by having the diversity that makes you know communities better by having varied types of people and families in, in buildings. Now, maybe just go back a little bit because. I think everyone's ears sort of like perked up when you said twenty-five thousand dollars per unit, and that's money that goes out of comes out of development charges, but also something called Section Thirty-Seven. Yeah. Maybe it's worth explaining sure, to everyone a little bit about Act, how that works. Under the Planning Act, there's a Section Thirty-Seven payment that um, is made as a calculation of uh, well, different charges have different calculations. Education charges are based on uh, you know our hard costs. We have public art contributions and we have Section 37, which is a tool for municipalities to direct funds in certain ways to 
help communities become better. Often um, they're used in, in what the community perceives may not be uh, directly good for the community itself. For example, the monies might flow back into a building that has a heritage component and the argument might be made that, well, this community needs something different. You know, the developer should be, for example, preserving the facade of the old Commerce Bank here. That should be part of my cause. Um, so, but Section 37 is a tool that, that allows, you know, uh, government officials to direct money into the community. Okay, we'll come back to Section 37. We have him, you have to go back there to talk to him. Well, you can just echo what I, what I say, because material costs have got to be a big driver here. Uh, and how it is that in baking this cake, developers have a hard time building more than kind of single bedroom units, which are great for young people, but less good for families. Well, I think um, first, first and foremost, I'll, I'll, the cake, the cake analogy is a pretty self-explanatory thing. You know, you throw in a bunch of components: land, hard costs, soft costs, consultants, architects, the rest of it, and we figure out what the area can support on an average revenue basis and we need to make a decent margin in order for us to take on the risk. So I won't bore you guys with the details of, you know, this is how much my concrete costs and all that kind of thing. But, but to your second point, um, if you can repeat the last part of your question there, because I thought that was interesting. Right. So it, it's that in so many of these new condominium developments, there yeah. are lots of studios or lots of one bedrooms. Yeah. There's much less available for people who have a family. Yeah. So. Uh, First and foremost, it, again, it's, it's a bit of a numbers game. I'm trying to amortize my costs over as many units as I can without getting offensive. And I'll, I'll say our projects included sometimes have units that are 375 square feet and 400 square feet, which is a really, really small unit. And, uh, but it's, it's a function, uh, and again, we're trying to get creative and you know uh, pack as much punch in that kind of space. But really, it's a function of the market. Uh, if I'm paying X for land, and these are the costs associated with developing that site. I'm, I'm in the business to try to make a decent profit. And, and my revenues are achieved by the number of units that I can sell and the numbers of kitchens and tiles and the rest of it that goes into each of those units. So that's really a function. But to, to your point, which I think is more, uh, is much more important for this evening's discussion, is that uh, Councillor Wong Tam, um, Adam Vaughn, uh, a number of councillors have made it their focus to uh, convince developers to include a certain amount of large two bedrooms and three bedroom units within their units at Massey and is at five and a lot of other developments in the city that threshold is around 10% of the overall units. Um, but I think again, if you drill down a little bit more and you say, okay, great, 10% of these units are gonna have three bedrooms in them, even though they're about 900 square feet and that's pretty tough to have three bedrooms in. Uh, even at 1,000 square feet, if you're looking at average selling prices in the city between six to $750, the absolute cost of that unit still makes it prohibitive for someone to buy that unit. If, if 1,000 square feet, um, a three bedroom unit, even if at the, at the lower portion of the building so we can reduce the cost, we can perhaps put it with, you know, where the views are a bit blocked, so the price premium isn't there, even at 700 bucks a foot, you're looking at $700,000 for 1,000 square feet. Uh, that's very expensive. Uh, we know that there's a lot of investors in the marketplace. Uh, various tools are used to assess the level of investors that we have. But at the end of the day, people, uh, whether you're an end user or an investor, you're looking for yield on your investment, and you're looking for some capital appreciation. And to date, uh, we see it slowly changing, okay? But we've rushed to the market with small units because investors like it, okay? They think they're gonna put a university student in there or the rent is gonna be really easy and the carrying costs aren't that high. I think you showed an average of uh, 14, just under $1,400 mm -hmm. in the rent for a two bedroom, which I don't know when you got that stat. It seems yeah. a bit low. Yeah. Um, I think that's a bit low. That's the average. Uh, uh, fair enough, that's the average, okay. So uh, it's a bit low. But I think it's, it's really just absolute numbers. Uh, you know, even though, and, and look, we're, we're putting 10% of the units. In fact, in Massey, we'll have a little more than the, the minimum 10%. But I think it's gonna be a grind to, to sell those units. I, I've already seen it. Uh, my partner and I have, you know, analyze our sales list every day and wake up and look at them and go to bed looking at them. That's, that's the nervousness that we all have until we can reach a certain threshold of sales. But those units are hard to move. Regardless if they are well designed and they can accommodate a family, the absolute dollar, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money. A lot of money to be living in a condo, uh, 900,000 square feet. We're going to come back to you a little later on and, and talk about the future uh, market in Toronto. Uh, you're trying to see that people who can't afford
afford condos and can't afford to buy uh, market value houses have great places to live. And at 84 houses a year, that's a, a heck of an accomplishment for a nonprofit, but it's still not going to put much of a dent in those trend lines that we're seeing. So give us your account of where things are at. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm looking over here and it says uh, rebuild Haiti. Um, as, as we look at our uh, at the coffee stand, and uh, had the opportunity to build there in uh, in November with uh, President Carter, who is, uh, as many of you know, uh, the best known volunteer of Habitat for Humanity, and um, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a discouraging build. Um, you know, the outcome was great. A hundred houses got built in five days, and that was wonderful. And Habitat's committed to fifty thousand homes being built in uh, in Haiti over the course of uh, of three years. Um, but, uh, but it was still discouraging to see uh, the despair that, that was there. And I came back and I had the privilege of talking with uh, General uh, Dallaire, Romeo Dallaire, uh, about the experience that I had had there. And he said something to me in, in sort of the, the uh, I was relaying this discouragement. Um, he said, you do what you do at Habitat for Humanity, not because you think the families are in despair, but because you know that they are equal. And, uh, and I think if we look at housing in sort of that vein, um, where it's, we need to do what we do, not because you know, there's a situation of poverty, but rather that there is a, an opportunity to provide uh, access to good, affordable housing to everyone who is, who is essentially equal, then, uh, then, then you, you, you reframe the, the discussion. Um, Brian Stevenson, uh, a lawyer in the United States, had a wonderful quote of saying that the opposite of poverty is not wealth but justice. And, and, and I really, I, I believe that, and I believe every time we create a housing opportunity, we give a slice of justice to um, every uh, man, woman, and child who crosses that threshold of a new home into, into a brand new future. So, uh, so with that sort of context, I, I look at um, what we've got you know, worldwide with, uh, with 960 million uh, living in slums uh, around the world. In Canada, 1.7 million households living in, sub in, living in substandard uh, housing. And then the waiting list is, 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 is as you pointed out, of 83,000. And, uh, and I say, and then, and then, you, then you rightfully brought it into the habitat context of volunteers, it gave so much. And we got 84 houses built uh, last year, and that was phenomenal in the city of Toronto because we got those built and we got them built affordably. Um, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And so that's where the advocacy piece starts to come in. And we talked about Section 37. And so I look at Section 37, and you know, the way I would frame Section 37 is developers have the opportunity to buy density. Would that be a fair sort of quick summary? Uh, not in part. Uh, but sort of. That, 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 was the, that, was the, that was the mandate of no, Section that's fair. 37. That's fair. So, so they have the opportunity to, to, to get additional bonusing um, by making community benefits. Um, community benefits like a, a public pool, uh, community benefits like, an, a, like a, a library or, or a park. But believe it or not, a community benefit as listed by the City of Toronto is not affordable housing. And, and, I, and I find that so outrageous. Um, and so one of the things that I, uh, we at Habitat for Humanity are working very hard at is changing a policy that we set at the City of Toronto to say, if a developer is putting in a million dollars into a, a Section 37 benefits, allow them and allow the councillor, as they start dividing up where that money should go, allow it to go to affordable uh, housing. To me, it makes sense. The, 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 the developer is building it. You know, you should presumably be able to leverage that expertise in doing it. So, um, so we're advocating hard. And, and what's wonderful to see on this is a great alignment where suddenly you have City of Toronto leadership, uh, staff, developers, and, uh, and affordable housing advocates all lined up to say, we can do something good out of this. And, and it's very rare that you get developers and affordable housing advocates lined up strategically. And this is, this is one opportunity for us to, to do it. So I, I would, you know, I, I don't know, I've probably gone over my time, but I would simply say, reframe the discussion as a matter of justice, and second, swing a hammer, if you can, and then part three, um, you know, build loudly by advocating. Um, and when you do that, I think we can uh, we can start to, to, to provide some hope to the 83,000 families on, on, on the waiting list.
that you get to be part of lots of discussions uh, about housing in Canada and abroad. Uh, aligning the Section 37 uh, opportunity or mechanism to serve uh, you know, the affordable housing agenda is one powerful gesture. Uh, but there's also been a big retreat from the province and federally in terms of the kinds of money that they would put into affordable housing. What's your take on kind of the d degree to which governments need to step into the market? There's a place for government and affordable housing. I mean, it, like there, there's there's no question about it. I mean, it's I don't, I don't think is there anybody who disagrees with that? Because I wouldn't mind. I, there's a role there, um, and the private sector um, needs to provide housing, and by providing that surplus, there is there is the opportunity to to uh, hopefully um, you know make sure that there is there's a, a good balance in the marketplace. But there are those who who uh, who need their arm around their shoulder to say um, that there needs to be a partnership with government to make it happen. And uh, and so when uh, you know there isn't a, a national housing strategy, but there is a, a, a provincial one. And I you know I, I'm fairly aligned with that. That says housing like politics is local. Um, and and the province has essentially said um, we want housing decisions to be done by the cities. And uh, and I think that that allows neighborhoods and cities as a whole to be able to, to, to come up with solid solutions. Section 37 and changes to that is, is one solution. Uh, the City of Toronto, it's coming to the executive, it just passed the executive committee, um, a 12-point plan done by both the nonprofit sector uh, and, the, uh, and the land development and the development sector. Uh, and city staff, when 12 points were brought forward on, here are things that you can do bureaucratically, here are things that you can do from a, uh, uh, from a, um, uh, uh, a changing of, of policies that will see housing built in, in the city. And, uh, and I think that those types of steps are really very positive. If, if, if we you know, simply say it's got to be done by government, I, I think that we alone then, uh, then we abdicate responsibility to, to sort of do it as, as well. And I think it takes all, all parties to do it. But the province, is, is, uh, the province and the feds have uh, renewed their commitment to affordable housing uh, recently, uh, over the course of uh, three years. Uh, three years. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, and so I, I see that as, as positive. But, uh, but there still needs to be more. And we do have self-imposed impediments at the city level that we can just scrape away at. I'm going to turn to the room uh, in just a moment for your questions for our panelists who has an inclusionary zoning policy. Can you tell us a little bit about what that might entail and whether that would be a good strategy for Toronto? Um, inclusionary zoning uh, is what it sort of sounds like. We're going to include everyone in a rezoning. Uh, and so if, uh, if, if there is a tower being built, it will require that a certain percentage of that be affordable. Um, there are a lot of housing advocates who are strongly in favor of that, and there are some who, who aren't. Um, and there, there's, there's points of merit on both sides of it. I don't think that it will come about, it, provincially it has to be legislated, and I don't think that that will happen over the next little while. Um, but uh, uh, the challenges with inclusionary zoning um, are not every building is it appropriate for that to happen. I can't, I don't believe that Trump Tower, it would be appropriate to necessarily have 30% of that housing be uh, affordable in, in that tower. Um, and so it needs to be uh, carefully done. I'm much more on the Section 37 side of things, which offers, instead of punitively saying to a developer, you've got to do it, and for something that might not necessarily fit, let's provide them cookies and benefits for doing it, and and actually have partnerships uh, in in making it ha happen. I'll give you a, a quick example. I used to be with with Tridel uh, twelve years ago, uh, and uh, and and I had the opportunity. So you could have been sitting on that. Chair. I could have been on that chair. Right. <laughs> I, I've switched sides, um, but, but it's actually not a side thing. And I, you know, for the most part, we really do need to, we do need to work together. Um, and I had the opportunity to be um, to, to work on Tem Bel Air. And if those of you who know Yorkville, it's a wonderful building. Uh, that uh, that uh, it's a fancy pants building. I think would be the simple way to describe it. 
And we were required to build 10 affordable housing units. We were forced to do it. So we did. And we used the city's definition of affordable housing at the, at the time. And what was that? We built 10 450 square foot units that we sold 12 years ago for $500,000 each. And, that, and we fulfilled our commitment to build a new affordable housing. And, and, and so when you force it in, there's a problem, but when you, and so, so I'm not a, a strong advocate in terms of uh, inclusionary zoning. I am much more an advocate on, let's see if we can work with developers so that they benefit by doing good. Fair enough. Let's turn to you, I suspect there are gonna be a The square foot analogy doesn't really make any sense because the square feet of a kitchen and the square feet of a bathroom is far more expensive than the square feet of the living room or of a bedroom. Like, when you have a bigger suite, it's not just the square footage that should be more expensive. It's, it's got one kitchen, maybe two bathrooms. You know, so I just find that whole use of the square foot, it's, it's simplistic and it, it makes the, the counting easy, but it doesn't make sense. Well, I think you need to look at square footage in combination with the absolute returns that people are trying to achieve when we're selling these units. Um, our biggest struggle is um, not necessarily the return on a larger unit or the rest of it. It's that those units aren't really moving. Um, and so, you know, there's one thing to say there's affordable housing. There's also building housing that can actually accommodate a family. I think we all agree here that, um, you know, 550 to 600 square feet is not going to cut it for a family. So regardless of the pricing, that's going to be an initial problem. But when it comes for us to build product, um, and when we looked at the tent, for example, you know, we're mandated to put at least 10% three-bedroom units in our building. It really, the size really is a function of us being able to achieve what we need to achieve in order to make these developments fly. So uh, I do agree with you to a certain degree that just saying, it's as loose as saying, well, if it's bigger, it still has one kitchen, this, that, and the other. We are trying to maximize to, to a reasonable degree um, the margins that we can achieve on, on these units. So uh, we found that um, the smaller units, up and again, I, I touched on this earlier, up till about, I'd say half a year ago, a year ago, we found it's strictly a small, small unit market. We've now started to see the investor and end user markets are turned to these larger one bedroom plus dens. The two bedroom market has, in, in all buildings across the city, with remaining inventory or new inventory that's being brought to the market, has, from what we've, we've seen in, in our various uh, sales agencies, that have told us that they're starting to pick up. So investors and families are starting to look at them. I think it's a function of the scare in the marketplace of people thinking perhaps rates may creep up and now is the time to get in. Uh, but I, I really don't know the end answer. I do know that you will start seeing bigger units, not only because developers will be mandated to do so, but I think the market is starting to turn to say, listen, these, these mid-sized two-bedroom units are something that we, see, we need to start considering because um, investors are starting to see their returns reduce when you have a bunch of small units in a building. Uh, you know, the wear and tear, the turnover, um, it's impacting people's investments. So people are looking for those larger units, not only for end-user purchasers, but they're thinking they're going to attract longer-term renters as well. So you got into two concepts there that haven't come out yet in our discussion, the end user and the investor. Right. Uh, who occupies that condo unit? That really has a big influence on the shape and character of a neighborhood, too. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think um, to, to the point you made now and then what I was trying to, to elaborate on is that the small, really if you look at it from a kind of a really primitive way, smaller units are conducive to like a single person living in the space, there's probably high rent turnover, more wear and tear on the building, it's more hassle for the investor or the owner of the unit, um, and people move on in life, you know, whether they have a partner or they start having children, 500 square feet is not going to cut it. But, um, so yeah, I think that's why I think that's why some of the supply is starting to change. And if you look at Toronto stock, um, and you kind of say, okay, what are our studios, what are our one bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera, we are, we have a heavy amount of smaller units here, and it's a function of people trying to, it's a function of developers trying to make their margins. Uh, but I think that that blood of supply, so if you look at existing stock in, in buildings right now, a lot of guys have some small product left over. Uh, people are starting to get creative and saying, we already have to do it. We're already getting pushed to start introducing larger units. And hey, wait a second, people are starting to look at these larger units and say, maybe I can make it work. You're designing your suites better so that that 800 square feet or 750 square feet is more effective you know, your, you know, whatever it's built-ins or however you want to get more creative to maximize the usage of the space. But there definitely is a trend moving towards those, to a, a bit of a larger uh, size. Okay. I distill down what you're looking for here. That inspires you to think, hey, actually, this is a price that can solve 
and so character special durability is for sure. What, what have you seen out there locally or domestically in the work that isn't happening in Toronto that might be something for us to take away as we come back on July 19th and think about? It? When we were doing a little bit of homework, uh, you know, when I was asked to sit on this panel, uh, it's unfortunate that our, our colleague from the UK couldn't speak on it because there are some very interesting models that uh, um, you can, you know, that, that have arisen in Europe. Um, Neil mentioned some interesting solutions that have, that have happened in the US. Um, but to kind of look at it from a step back perspective, and, and I really feel that there are a number of parties that need to get, be able to get together to provide stock or, or accessibility of, this, of the inventory that we have. <laughs> of units in the city um, in order for all walks of people to, to get to them. I just don't think that um, one, you know, putting, for example, the emphasis on the developers or the not-for-profit organizations or saying it's all government. Uh, to Neil's point, uh, if we have a, concert, you know, a joint effort, everyone pitches in great ideas, I think that's going to work. And to be a little bit more specific, I strongly believe that um, some of the monies that flow at the municipal level um, they're not enough. They're not being directed uh, to the Toronto housing development community in order for us to build and provide better stock or more affordable stock. And I think that both the provincial and federal levels of government need to start addressing this issue. Uh, because, look, it's, it's, it's not like we're talking about going to buy a CD or a new iPod. This is you know, the most expensive purchase that most of us are going to make in our life. It's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big purchase, and I think in order for it to become more affordable, uh, the number of parties need to get involved. Obviously, you think about, or at least I do, I think about operating costs and making sure that those operating costs to whoever you're selling it are costs that they can afford. And so, um, so we want to make sure that they are as energy efficient. And actually, Ontario's getting quite good on that front in terms of uh, providing a regulatory environment that, uh, that requires all home builders to, uh, to fit with, uh, within that. There is, there is that uh, uh, apex of the curve in terms of how much you're spending on environmentally uh, good things to do in a home, uh, where you get such a diminishing return you know, after the first, you know, uh, say, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth of upgrades to the home. So I think you've got to put that into to an economic context. But um, you can't build a home that the person living it can't afford to operate. And, uh, and that's on a micro level and on a macro level, you can't build a home that we can't afford as a society to have operate if it's, if it's emitting you know, four tons, six tons of carbon every single year. So that's my sustainability answer. The question about what inspires and what models inspire is probably the fa my favoriteest question that I've had in a long time. So thank you for that, and I'll try to, uh, in exchange, give you a brief answer. Um, there are models when it comes to uh, out of the cold um, that have to happen in the city, where uh, where a gym. Uh, of a church becomes a, uh, a place for a guest to spend an evening on a mat. That's not ideal, it's a band-aid, um, but hospitals still use band-aids. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a volunteer community that's providing uh, care and affection at the very uh, lowest in terms of and the greatest need that you can possibly imagine. And so we still need that care where somebody really cares genuinely about the person on that mat. You also need government intervention in terms of rent gear to income. You need government intervention in terms of transitional housing. Um, but I think we need to, to the earlier point, think about housing as a continuum and that there is transition that, that needs to happen, not only with the housing stock, but the individual in there and set up systems of incentives that allow for that to, uh, to happen.